Also a huge financial burden, which brings us now to the economy. You know, for a great many people, it's become a system that is in part broken, and in part a result of the 2008 financial collapse. So how do we climb out and get to a place of progress? Well, you know, big problems need big ideas. And here's one. Start with this. Money. And throw it away. Sounds crazy, right? Well, now we're going to talk to someone who thinks this might be exactly what we need. Peter Joseph is a filmmaker and also the founder of the Zeitgeist movement. Hey there, Peter. I'm, of course, simplifying here. It's not just get rid of money or currency. It's instead making this monetary-based economy, uh, you make it a resource-based economy. Talk about what this actually means. Well, actually, you're half right. A resource-based economy explicitly does want to remove the actual mechanics of exchange and the market system itself, as radical as that may seem to most. You have to understand, first of all, that the problems we're seeing in the world is not the result of some bad policy or some legislation or some inflationary cycle, boom and bust phenomenon that we're typically taught in traditional economics. The very foundation of the economic structure is intrinsically flawed. We create money out of debt. We charge interest on it, which doesn't exist. We create the principal, but yet the principal plus the interest is always outstanding. People, it's a game of musical chairs to put into a singular phrase. Everyone systematically suffers through this system and it's offset. So when you hear about debt collapse, sovereign debt defaults, these are inevitabilities of the system. They're not based on just someone's rogue policy or some flagrant activity of the stock market and derivatives. Granted, those are very important attributes of it. But my point in my work with the movement is that the system is intrinsically, inherently flawed. And for us to get on a, on a, on a scale, on a pace, on a, on a, uh, in a way to make our society sustainable and not suffer all these economic consequences, we have to get down to the life ground of what actually supports human life, what we've learned from the natural world, the systems that actually, that actually generate food. When you realize this, we live in a technical reality, not a monetary one. And if we, for example, one, one child dies every five seconds from poverty and preventable diseases on this planet. This is, of course, unnecessary technically. We could easily feed everyone on this planet. And when you extrapolate that train of thought, when you take a technical perspective as opposed to a monetary perspective, we see we could resolve just about all of the major human woes on this planet by restructuring the entire economic phenomenon to be truly economic, meaning well, Peter, you were talking, though, earlier about... You were talking earlier and you said, you know, everyone suffers by this system. I think that maybe, uh, let's clarify a little bit. A lot of people suffer, but there are some people who want to keep this system exactly how it is. Isn't that right? Yeah, I'd say the upper 1% certainly, is in, uh, certainly has a prime interest, has a very easy way to justify uh, the fruits that they've, they've claimed. We have 1% of the world's population owning 40% of the planet's wealth. If that isn't a signpost to the intrinsic flaw of this system, that it's there to perpetuate one class over another, I'm not sure what is. So yes, the proper 1% has a very vested interest, and naturally that carries on to the governments, which are essentially funded and supported by the corporate institutions and I know you've that continue this. You've written about this uh, large gap between the rich and poor, and I know one point that you've made in your writings is that America is one of the most socially immobile countries in the world. I kind of had to stop and read that again when I saw that, uh, but basically what you're saying, I think, is if you're born poor, chances are you'll stay poor, other than, of course, a few exceptions. Yes. Uh, how does this change under the zeitgeist system? Well, it's not the zeitgeist system. Uh, this work builds upon uh, research from, by the man of Jacques Fresco, which builds upon researchers from, from well, the past 150 years, people that have continually thought about a different economic model not based on monetary exchange and all of the intrinsic problems that come out of that. Uh, the Venus Project is something important to mention, which I su suggest people look into. That is a partnership with the zeitgeist movement. And it's a blueprint system based on referencing natural law. What that means is you actually get to the life ground, as I mentioned earlier. You look at what it means to make a human being, what it means to meet the needs of the human necessity, from obviously the bare necessities to all of the emotional and uh, biopsychosocial phenomenon that actually generate our behavior, generate our well-being, our mental health. When you put all this together, which is a completely technical orientation, very limited when it comes to human opinion, this is what science has given us, by the way, you see that the current economic model is stuck in time. It's not actually re representing what meets human needs. And the more you step back and look at how we could technically provide for the human population, eliminate war, eliminate famine, eliminate poverty, eliminate 95% of most crime, which, by the way, is monetary related, 
you begin to see that an entirely new approach can be taken. It's very difficult for me to describe that to you in a very short little segment, but a resource-based economy is based upon resource management intrinsically. Monetary relationships don't manage anything. We have cost efficiency. We have all of these things that inhibit our ability to create sustainable goods. We have established institutions that are constantly trying to preserve their market share. It's essentially a mafia orientation. It's one group against another. Everyone's battling, and we have this illusion that somehow it's for the betterment of us, that we, we have this self-interest, and it isn't. It hasn't, it's provably not if you look through history and what we're actually doing to ourselves. And we're on a train wreck to a complete environmental disaster and a social disaster. Peter, I, I want to interrupt you real quick. Um, I can just hear the, the bad election commercials in my head. Uh, you know, if this movement gains momentum, uh, the people who the system does benefit are going to come back, and this is what they're going to say. They're going to say, he wants to bring us back to, uh, you know, he wants to make us a communist society. What do you say of to course. that? Of yeah. course. Well, that's all they know. Well that's, well, that's all they know. That's their entire frame of reference. You see, the propaganda of the West and the free market, or the free-for-all market, as I call it, is to constantly assume back, orient back to these old structures that were based on autocratic dictatorship with no real communist attribute to it. All. A true communist idea is a family, you know, something I think we all can relate to. We are about intelligent resource management, learning about how to take care of ourselves technically and creating a ground up system that does that. And the only way you can do that is by the elimination of this, this supposed uh, self-interest intrinsic attribute of our system that we think is natural. Obviously we all have self-interest, but self-interest must become social interest if we expect to survive as a species, very simply. I think so one of the questions people... The one of the questions people would have is, under this system, um, what's the incentive? What's the incentive to contribute more, to try harder, if uh, in the end it's, we're all going to be equals? Well, first of all, no one's just equal in an arbitrary sense. That's a, a loaded kind of concept. Equal in the ability to get the necessities of life, to get out of the materialism that we have that fuels this, this conspicuous consumption that's destroying the planet. These values will change. So the incentive will be people actually understanding that when they contribute to society, when they do something real, not work in advertising or the stock market, when they do something and they're educated to actually contribute to society, it's for their own self-betterment themselves. So when I was, if I was an inventor, I would invent something not to make money off of it. That's a very sick, distorted idea. I would invent something to better the world, knowing that that would come back to me in my own betterment. So it's a completely different value structure. And the best thing I can relate to you is the, the idea of a family, the idea of what it means to live in a family and the respect that's mutual in a family where you're not tipping your mother every time she brings you something at the table. It's an entirely new value system orientation. Unfortunately, we have to undo the tremendous psychological distortion that's been created after well, more or less centuries of this despotic system that is failing right in front of us and will lead to simply more war, more poverty. So I don't really have to defend it by the fact that all you have to do is watch what's happening right now and what's going to continue to happen if you follow the trends. And just real quick, if you do look around what's happening, especially right now, this is not, um, I know that your idea and your movement has uh, followers all around the world. More than 200 countries have chapters. Talk about why this is not just a national idea, that, but kind of an international one. Oh, absolutely. Well, sovereignty is essentially a mirror of a corporate concept. It's a self-preserving idea. Uh, the world's going to have to learn to work together. I'm, I'm sorry to say to all the politicians out there, the jingoistic, patriotic, in the words of Albert Einstein, patriotism is a disease. It's one world, it's a single round planet, and it's time we recognize it as such. We have to manage the world in this way too, so there's a firm technical reality. It's not just philosophical. So the Zeitgeist movement is about bridging the difference between all races, all nationalities, all religions, all all everything that divides us because we all have to come back to the basic necessities of life. And we can't even get that right within the monetary system. The suffering is, is unacceptable and not necessary. So it's, it's, certainly not, it's a, a global a, movement firmly. firmly unfortunately, global. we're out of time, Peter, but certainly a, a big idea sure. in this time that is filled with some really big problems. Peter Joseph, filmmaker and also founder of the Zeitgeist Movement.